what happens? I, I know for me, as I'm approaching the new year, I did what many of you do and have done is I reflected on 2020. I'm like, wow, now what? And, uh, and I thought about everything that happened. I, there were some painful moments. I lost my, my grandpa and my grandma uh, in 2020. That was hard. I, we said goodbye to, to the Texas churches, you know, after six years, that's the longest we'd ever been anywhere as disciples for Tyler and I, um, that was painful. Then exciting, even a little daunting moments of coming and placing membership in the mighty SF church and getting to insert ourselves into the incredible San Jose region and getting to build new friendships. Uh, that's been amazing and exciting. And doing all of that in a pandemic had its challenges, right? We had to get very, 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 very creative at times. And uh, there are a lot of fun moments. I, I, I know it feels like a lifetime ago, but the Hawaiian Islands Missions Conference last year, I, I, I remember laughing my face off with Matthew and Salma and the Garritos to the point where we couldn't breathe. I remember prayer walks on the beach in the morning and getting to pray with Sarah. That was such a special moment as uh, we're, you know, building a deeper friendship ourselves. And I remember, I remember watching uh, a bunch of the disciples get on stage trying to learn how to do the hula. Many of you were in that video. And uh, it was such an incredible time. I remember um, coming here and, and having virtual women's days. Like, nope, we were not even, we weren't doing anything like that. And here we are in 2020 having to get creative and figure this thing out together. I remember being on the phone with Janora and Alexis and, and Zania, whereas we're trying to brainstorm invites. I remember working behind scenes with Camille and Sylvie and, and Alicia and Angel as we're trying to figure out how to, how to do this. I, I, so many incredible moments. I, I remember just shenanigans at the Spankinson's house. I remember Bonchon with the Sarkodiers and stand up paddle boards with Ashton and Kara and, and just so, and, and the adventures with the Shramily. I mean, those are epic. And just so many amazing things came out of 2020. And every year I like to do a, a prayer wall or a, or a prayer board. And uh, I was looking back on um, pictures of, of my prayer wall in Texas and uh, then the one that we created here and just, just the faith building moments of seeing people get baptized that, we, that were on the prayer wall and you see it come to fruition. You get to move my little sticky note from prayers to prayers answered. That's like such an incredible feeling when you've prayed for something and God answers it and you get to move that note. See, I prayed for so many people's health last year. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, we're still praying for people's health this year and seeing God heal them, uh, seeing fallaways being restored. I, I'm seeing Bree's mom study the Bible. That's been on my prayer list since we got here to SJ. Wow. I was so encouraged to be able to move that and be like, yeah, I'm praying for her to be a disciple. And so 2020 was so incredible, but here we are at the door of 2000. 2021 and and many of us are making vision boards right now and thinking about our goals thinking about our dreams and to be honest as I approached this year of mountain moving faith I I remember talking to Ashley on the phone and being like Ashley I don't know what my dreams are and that scared me that scared me guys I was like what are my dreams you know I had so many dreams as a young Christian on, and God's awesome he answered so many of them brought so many goals and dreams and visions to fruition but I was like what now and I felt like I was stuck and I remember telling her I was like this scares me because without vision we die people die without vision without dreams guys and so I did a deep dive uh, in my heart and prayer and the scriptures, looking for lessons everywhere, just fighting to restore some dreams and some new vision. And, Come on, Faye. And so Come tonight, on, I'm really emotional. Uh, tonight, I'm going to share with you what, uh, what God's really been teaching me, what God's put on my heart. And, and, um, and you know, we're going to hear a lot about mountain moving faith this weekend. I'm so excited for the winter workshop. But tonight, I just want to talk about goals and visions and dreams and just our need for vision. And the title of my lesson tonight is Hindsight is 2020. Get it? Hindsight is 2020. We just got out of the year vision and I finally see my need for it. Hindsight is 2020. And uh, really quick, I, I don't know about you, but when I approach a vision board, I typically write goals, visions, and dreams like at the top, and they kind of just get all thrown in there. But this year I, I broke it down. I'm like, what is a goal? A goal is something that you tangibly can accomplish. Like you look at it and you're like, I can do that with, a, with, a, with some self-denial, 
with some discipline, with some focus and a bit of faith, you know, and some prayer, I, I can do that. That's a goal. A dream is something that is out of, is largely out of your control, right? It's not something that you can make happen or accomplish for yourself, or is it maybe realistic or like in the, you know what I mean? Like where you can see the trajectory of it. So, so it doesn't make it on the goal list. It's still a dream. It's something that's far off. Maybe something that, you know, maybe changes I desire to see in my family or in my husband. Those are things I don't have control over. Those are things I must take to God, my dreams. And then I surrender them in the hands of God, because oftentimes I've dreamt for things, but that doesn't mean that's necessarily God's dream. And so we dream, we place it in the hands of God and we surrender it there. Then what is a vision? A vision is something that scares you. When you catch the vision, you're like, whoa, it scares you a little. Like you will have to totally rely on God and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to see that, to see that thing come to fruition. And so tonight I want to talk a bit about vision because what our vision is will determine what your dreams are and will, and will determine what your goals are. The first point is God is a visionary. God is a visionary. Come on, Shay. Oh, come on, Shay. Let's go to Romans chapter four. Come on, Shay. Romans chapter come four. On, Shay. This is awesome. And we're going to read uh, verse 17, part B. Really short passage, really powerful meaning. It says, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. God is a visionary. It says he gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. And so I thought about it. I'm like, wow, God looked down and saw Gideon hanging out in a wine press, feeling sorry for himself. And he said, that's a mighty warrior, a military commander, future leader. Wow. God looked down and he saw a young orphaned uh, Jewess, Esther, hanging out, right, in, in pagan Persia and said, that's a queen and a future liberator of God's people. God looked down and he saw Moses. And what's awesome is even if you lose the vision, God doesn't lose the vision for you. And so Moses is hanging out in Midian, building a comfortable, mediocre life there, running from his calling. And God said, absolutely not. This is the vision. You're going to go and you're going to liberate my people. You're going to be a Come bold, on, humble Come leader on, for Shay. millions. Imagine on, what Shay. God sees when he looks down and sees you. Because God sees things not as how they are, but as how they will become. You know, and uh, we don't need to turn there. But in 2 Corinthians... Ver, uh, chapter five, verse six, 16, it teaches, the Bible teaches us that we're, we're called to no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. And that includes yourself. You can no longer regard yourself from a worldly point of view. Too That's many right. of us, including myself, have given into insecurity. And that is just pride, ladies, with a fancy name. We have focused way too much on ourselves. We have thought way too much of ourselves, but when you get insecure, what are you telling God? God, I know me better than you know me. Your word is not true. Your vision for my life is not possible because I know things you don't know. And therefore I'm awful. I'm terrible. I'm not capable. And you nullify the word of God with your insecurity. You are not allowed sisters to regard yourself from a worldly point of view anymore. Because when God looks down, he doesn't see who you are right now. He sees who you're going to become because our God is a visionary. That is the God we put our faith in. It's really wow. awesome. In Romans wow. 4, uh, 17 in the NLT version, I love different translations because it just hits different, you know what I mean? And, uh, or slaps or whatever the cool kids say these days. It just hits different, you know? And it says that God, brings, say. in the NLT, it says that God brings the dead back to life and creates new things out of nothing. I'm like, yeah, that's the God we serve. I don't know how you're feeling coming into 2021. Maybe there's some dead areas in your life. Maybe you feel like, man, my evangelism is dead. Jo join the club. I feel that way. I've let the pandemic become an excuse for a, a, a lack of evangelism. 
I have let Zoom and all these things and, and, and having to wear a mask become an excuse for dead evangelism. What about your prayer life? Do you feel dead in that? Do you, maybe you feel like, man, it's, it's, it's dead over here. We got no studies. Uh, whatever, what, maybe areas of your character, maybe you feel hopeless in your marriage or with your children. Maybe you feel hopeless about your future. Whatever is dead, God can resurrect because that's what God does. He's a visionary. And then it says that he can make something out of nothing. Even if you look and see nothing, it doesn't matter. We are not women who live by sight. We live by faith in an almighty, all-powerful God. God sees something that's when there's nothing. He created the universe with his words. He spoke and bam, it came into existence. Mm, true. So why could God not start something where there's nothing? Why could God not resurrect dead things or dead areas of your life? God is a visionary. Um, my second point is with vision comes direction. Let's go to Acts chapter 27. Come on, sis. Okay. Come on, this is awesome. Come on. Let's We've go, got to fight to be imitators of God, right? We've got to fight to imitate God's vision. Not only vision for ourselves, vision for our women. I know it's, a lot of times we can focus our vision boards just on ourselves. What's your vision for the women you disciple? What's your vision for your Bible talk? What's your vision for your family? What, 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 what do you see? What, do you, what are your goals? What are your dreams? We need to articulate. The issue is not the faithfulness of God. The issue is, is whether we're, we're faith-filled enough to put it on the board. That's the real issue. And so with vision comes direction. At, let's go to Acts 27. Let's go, Shay. Come on, Shay. This is great, Shay. Right, Acts 27. And we're picking it up here uh, with our awesome brother, Paul. And uh, he's in the middle of a storm, like an actual storm, right? And, uh, and, and they haven't seen the sun. They haven't seen stars for days. That's how crazy this storm is. Okay. He's on a boat, the storm. He hasn't seen, he hasn't seen like any sunlight or stars for days. And at this point, they've pretty much given up hope that, that, that they're going to live. Okay, it was that bad. And we're going to pick it up here in verse 22. Paul says, but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of, uh, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. And I love this because when Paul got the vision, he's like, I got to go to Caesar. I've got to preach the word in Rome. That's the vision. Suddenly there was a clear direction. He knew he's like, we're not going to die. This isn't going to happen. Nope, I don't care what, I don't care that we're in the middle of a storm. I don't care what the situation physically looks like because my vision has given me a direction. And that, yeah, sure, we're gonna lose the ship. We're gonna run along some island, but I've got to get to Caesar because that is God's vision. And I know his word, he's gonna keep it because God is faithful, right? And so let's, let's take a look really quick at Proverbs 29, verse 18. It's a passage we've read many times over this last year in the year of vision. Come on, Shay. Proverbs 29, verse 18. I'm going to read it in the King James Version. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And literally in this story, that's exactly what would have happened. If Paul had not gotten a vision, everybody on that ship would have perished. But what's amazing is in the Passion Translation, whoo -whoo, for the TPT, wow. it says, when there is no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. When you have no vision in your life, that's what happens to you spiritually. You wander astray. Let's talk about the holidays. How are we doing? Talk about it. Did we wander astray in our convictions? Did we wander in some, into some sin, into some impurity, into some immorality, into some laziness, into some debauchery? I mean, the list is long. Come but on. that's why we have a winter workshop, guys, <laughs> to call us back, right? To get us back on track with a clear vision so we no longer wander astray. But this is the version that hit me the hardest in the NLT. It says, when people do not accept divine guidance, when they don't have vision, right? 
they run wild. They run wild. Come on, Shay. And so I'm like, without vision, guys, we're, we're literally, we just start acting like a bunch of animals, even as disciples, and we just start living off our instincts. Everything becomes instinctual, right? Like, we, and how, what does that look like as disciples? We start living day to day, right? Just every, just every day, days kind of come and days kind of go, and we just live off of our instincts, what we're feeling or thinking in the moment, what our experience or our thoughts tell us, and, and, uh, you know, we, we don't, we don't really have like any real plans or ambition. Maybe we have some daily goals, maybe, you know, have a quiet time. But other than that, we just kind of live day to day off of our instincts or wherever the wind blows, we're doing stuff, but there's no real urgency for anything. Uh, we get disconnected from reality, disconnected from our hearts uh, with what's really going on. We get disconnected from God's dream, God's visions, right? And then what happens? Your, your sexual instinct kicks in. And, and it's like, Hey, and you just give in you, your impure thoughts. You don't restrain them. You cast off the restraint, right? Cause you have no vision. Your, uh, your laziness, right? You, you wake up in the morning and the lazy instinct kicks in and, and you, and you snooze the alarm because you have no vision to get you up out of bed. You have no vision to motivate you or drive you. You, uh, you get you, your thoughts just get so consumed with self because you have no vision for anything outside of yourself without vision. We run wild. We just start living instinctually instead of the Bible being our guide, our compass, our light through the fog and through the darkness. If there's, if there is no outside vision, we have no direction, no motivation, and we don't do anything different. We live with no restraint. And then what happens is your conscience doesn't even really bother you anymore because you don't, you don't really see what you're supposed to be living up to. You know, there's no, there's nothing you feel like you need to be pursuing. And so you're not really even bothered by it. You're like, yeah, I had a quiet time, yeah. faithful, came up to, came to midweek, came to Devo, showed up at church. Things are good. And, uh, and the reality is, is people could still think you're really awesome, but you know who you are when nobody's looking, when you turn off the camera, you know, what's going on in your heart, you know, what's going on in your mind. You, you know, who you are when nobody is watching is who you are. Uh, okay. Um, when we live life with no vision, we'll be destroyed by the lion that never sleeps. He's subtle and he will wait for an opportune time to attack. And so let's go to Hebrews chapter two. So good, Shay. Come, Come on, sis. Shay. Let's go. Come on, sis. Let's go, Shay. Hebrews chapter two, verse one, it says, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. Guys, we are so blessed. I, I know that for many of you who've been baptized here in the SF church, and this is all you've known, this might, this might not fully make sense, but you are so blessed to be here, to be under the leadership of Jason and Sarah and all of the amazing region leaders that are here, to be in a place where there's a company of prophets and a culture of leadership, to be in a place where you see miracles happening often, to be in a place where you literally get fire lessons many times a week, like to the point where you can't even swallow it as quickly as it's coming at you. But the reality is, is when we don't have vision, we don't pay careful attention to the things that are being taught because there's, there's no, there's no vision. So what are you even applying it to? It's like, yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Great points. And it just gets shoved in a notebook. You don't look at it again. We need vision we need to pay careful attention to the things that are being taught. So we don't drift away. You can be in the kingdom and it's drifting from God faithful to the kingdom more than you are to the creator and to the vision that he's placed on our life. Um, my third point for you, and this is the one we'll camp on a little bit, is with vision comes responsibility. With vision comes responsibility. Let's go over to Nehemiah chapter one. Come on, Shay. Let's go, Shay. This is awesome. Come on, Shay. Come on, sis. Nehemiah chapter one. We're going to pick it up here in verse one. 
names. So forgive me in advance for these names because I never pronounce Old Testament names right. Okay. okay, Nehemiah chapter one. The words of Nehemiah, son of Halkaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are back in the province, are in, our, are in great trouble and distress. The walls of Jerusalem, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let's stop there. Okay, so what's happening? We got our awesome, awesome, uh, you know, Jewish brother there, Nehemiah. And uh, he's cupbearer to the king, the Persian king, right? And uh, what happens? Hanani, Hanani comes to town, his brother, along with some other men. And, uh, they, and they come from Judah, right? And, and he sees them and he's like, guys, guys, so tell me. Tell me everything that's been going on. Like, how are, how are our brothers? How are the remnant who survived the exile? How are they doing? He's like, I mean, this is like, he's waiting for a good news email right here. You know, he's like, how are they, how are they doing? How are they, how's Jerusalem doing? How, how, what's the state? What's the state of our, our, of, of our city, of our, of where we go to worship our God? What's going on there? And what, and what happens? He hears that the walls of Jerusalem have been broken down. The gates have been burned with fire that his people are suffering. They're in trouble. They, they're, they feel they're in disgrace. And suddenly it hits Nehemiah like a ton of bricks. I believe it was in this moment, Nehemiah caught the vision. And I believe that's also partly why he went and cried because I think the vision scared him. He knew, he's like, as soon as you see the need as a disciple, you just, you, you feel the need to meet it. When you see the needs as a disciple, like really see them. Like when something cuts your heart, just like it did when you studied the Bible, right? You were cut to the heart and you're like, what do I got to do? Nothing was going to stop you from repenting of your sins and getting baptized because you saw what your sin did to Jesus Christ on the cross. And there's a cutting to the heart when we see our responsibility for the vision of God. And, and, and it scares us because we're like, oh, wow, this is going to call a lot of me. It is going to call me so far out of my comfort zone. And so what did he do? He went, he cried, he mourned, he prayed, he fasted. And uh, we're going to go into Nehemiah's prayer in a minute, but I just want to, I want to sit here for a second. Like, do you feel the burden of the evangelization of the nations? I think all, I think most of us on this call believe in the evangelization of the nations, right? We, that's, that's why we sacrifice, we give missions, you know, we're, 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 we're a part of the sold out movement. Like we want to see that happen. And we're like, yes, we got to get to all nations. We get fired up when a city gets put on the roadmap. We're like, yes, there's hope. We get so excited. But do you feel the personal burden and responsibility to get that job done? Wow. Come on. Yeah, come on, Shay. Next question. This is this is this is also revealing. Do you believe that whether or not you choose to obey that vision has a deep impact in the in in in, in the you know battle to win the world? Do you believe that whether or not you pick up your sword and fight, or you lay it down and decide to live by sight or run in flight? Pardon all my rhymes. I'm not I'm not a rapper. Um, whether you choose to pick up that sword and fight or take off and run from your calling will make an eternal impact. Because we need to feel the responsibility of evangelizing the world in our generation. And we need to understand that whether or not we choose to do something equals souls, equals nations, equals your own companies of profits. Like so much is on the line. And if you do not have a vision for the evangelization of the nations and you do not personally feel that responsibility, you will run wild. You will wander astray. You will be in the kingdom living day to day. Because when you understand that this is on your shoulders collectively and individually, what you do every day matters. Your goals change. Your dreams for your life, for your future, they change. 
because you're like, I cannot be disobedient to the vision. I have, I, I play a crucial role. I, I serve a crucial purpose in reaching this world because my God is a visionary and he has put a vision on my heart. Don't wait for someone to tell you, you became a disciple. You read Matthew 28 many times, might I add, and you saw that the vision was to reach the nations and you took on the call to make disciples of all nations, being willing to go anywhere and do anything and give up everything. God didn't make mistakes when he chose you, when he called you. This vision, this responsibility is on your shoulders and whether or not you catch this vision will totally dictate your dreams and your goals oh, and ultimately okay. your future. And so here we are, the walls have been broken down. Worldwide, there is a need. There are remnant out there just waiting for us to plant a church. There are people hurting, yeah. disgraced. Huh. People in this pandemic right now are sitting inside four walls and feel hopeless, thinking about yeah. committing suicide. Right. There are women that are handing themselves over to drugs, handing themselves over to drunk, a, a drunkenness, handing themselves over to toxic, unhealthy relationships. Some even because they don't want to end up on the street because maybe they lost their job. So they stay in the home with the toxic relationship or the toxic situation. I mean, the, the, the list is so long, but do you keep it in front? Do you keep it in front of your eyes? Do you pray about the condition of the world? Does it break your heart to the point where you feel like I must do something. I cannot keep quiet any longer. I cannot stay back any longer. I can no longer shrink back from the vision that God has put on my life. Yes, it scares me and I will have to totally rely on God to become who he's calling me to be, but I will do it. Amen. Then my Amen. sisters, we will see, we will see a faith that moves mountains. That's our shame. That's right. Because we'll see the mountain, but then we'll see the God who has the power to move that mountain if we but obediently by faith a, a, a call answer this vision and so okay. i know for me personally um I, the reason that all of this even came about just to be totally open is is i felt like i felt like you know in the kingdom i, I had a lot of dreams right i had a dream to to you know be a women's ministry leader and and i had a dream to be on a mission team and and one day maybe even lead a mission team and i had a had a dream to get married and i had a dream to baptize women to learn a new language and guess what god did all of that which is amazing i'm so grateful but then here i am coming into 2021 and i'm like now what and i realized that I no long, I did not feel the burden of the evangelization of the nations on my shoulders. That's why I felt aimless. That's why I had no more vision or no more dreams or no more kingdom dreams. And, and, and honestly, sisters, like your biggest dream cannot be marriage. Come on, sis, call it out. Come on, Shay. Yep. Because if your biggest That's vision is to get married, what happens once you do? Hmm. Will that be the idol in your life that you worship? You just like but you're acting super okay. spiritual to get to that point. The word. You just don't you're just no longer like a disciple anymore. You just drop the vision. Your biggest ambition cannot be to be a leader. It's awesome. Don't get me wrong. Desiring leadership is a noble thing. But what do you really desire about it? Do you desire the success, the recognition, the title, the acknowledgement that ooh look at sparkly title you're a leader? One. Or do you desire the heart of Jesus and the responsibility and the courage to take it on? So that you can see more souls won. Is it all for God's glory or is it for your glory? A vision is not making every area of your life better. And this was the biggest mind blowing moment for me because I feel like when I looked back at the last few years in Texas, I had lost my vision. I had lost my, my drive or my, my urgency, my, that personal responsibility to see the nations won. And Preach. you know what happened? My discipleship became what I like to call like Christianity self-help. Wow. Come on. Wow. And, and so it just became about just being the best disciple version of myself. You know, like I'm going to, I'm going to be really disciplined and get fit. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, you know, uh, be a good example. I'm going to be the best wife I can be. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get really good at those first principle studies. And don't get me wrong, all of these are all of these are awesome ambitions. It's great to be excellent. Those are great goals, but that's not vision. 
Wow. Come on. Come on. Your, your discipleship Monster. cannot be spiritual self-help. Tell us, tell us. It needs to be a vision to evangelize the nations. You know what happened to me, guys? I lost my drive, my hunger, my hunger to learn. Like that feeling I felt when I was at staff meetings all those years ago in LA where I would just, I would sit and I would take notes like a fiend and be so excited to go back over them because I just wanted to swallow down and, and, and implement everything I was being taught because I saw the vision. And I was like, I don't have time to mess around. I've got to, I'm hungry. What else can I do? How, how, what, how much more can I grow? How, who can I share my faith with? There was a drive, but then what happened is I lost my hunger for that. And you know what happens? Then you're like, you're sitting there and you're like, I know enough to make a disciple. I'm good. I know enough to disciple women now. Like it's sufficient, you know, it's sufficient enough. Like I can, I can, I can do the disciple thing, be in the kingdom, you know, make my way around, but you're not going to move mountains with yeah, that. You're, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to fully live God's vision for your life with that. And I'm so encouraged to be back, uh, to be back, you know, in Cali and specifically to be here with you guys. Cause so much of the, of, of, of the dullness, right. Of, of the, of these ministry tools is being resharpened. So many of the convictions that I drop by the wayside are being picked back up and, it, but Come when on, it, Jay. Started, it started with my heart in reigniting a vision to have God's vision for a lost and hurting world. That's where it started. It didn't start with my goals guys. It didn't start with all the spiritual health, self-help goals. It started with my heart before my creator out of gratitude for Jesus's sacrifice and a clear view of a hurting world and that I was responsible to do something. Come on. Come on. And so let's look at Nehemiah. Let's look at his prayer for a moment. And we're going to get some great practicals from his prayer. Preach this. All right. We're going to pick it up here in verse five. Nehemiah says, then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. And I love this prayer of Nehemiah. And it just, it, 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 te- it taught me a lot as I sat in the pocket of this prayer. And what do we see? First, Nehemiah, just re- he just had to remember how big God is. You know what I mean? Like, Oftentimes we can come into prayer and we come in like, I've done this like a million times. So I'm, I'm preaching for, to the choir here. You come into prayer hey, like, hey God, good morning. Oh, Grateful snap. for today. You know, I'm just feeling a lot today, God. Just, you know, feeling discouraged and sad. And, mm-hmm. and then we go through a laundry list of all of our negative emotions. You know what I mean? Come on, Shay. I've done this so many times. And you're like more discouraged after you talk about all the bad stuff you know? And, and now it's like an uphill climb to get faithful in your prayer, you know? And, uh, and don't get me wrong. You need to be honest and real with God, but all too often, right? Like Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And first he told them, you better adore God. You better get some adoration in there, right? Because he understood. He's like, you need to remember the magnitude and awesomeness of God, because then you'll look at the mountain, but you'll see past the mountain. You'll see the God who moves mountains. David didn't see Goliath. He saw the God behind Goliath, who's like, throw the stone, bro. I got this. Right. Like, that's the God we need to get connected to. The visionary God. The God who can do anything. And then suddenly, the rest of your prayer, you're like, God, I'm sad. But God, you're going you're gonna to help me overcome. 
God, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling with a little faithlessness with this woman we're studying the Bible with, but God, you can move her heart. I can't, but I'm going to go in there. I'm going to faithfully preach the word and God, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling hopeless in my marriage and this and that, but God, like there, there is no hopelessness with you. Hopelessness is in the grave there, you exist and you can change anything. And so God change me, help me be the wife I need to be. God, move in my husband, move in my children. Like, like okay. there's hope. There's this positive expectation of the future because you have a clear view of God. That's how we need to pray. Then what do we see Nehemiah do? Yeah, we see him cry, right? Because we need to cry uh, in our prayers. The best prayers come from a broken heart, guys. When you, when you cry before God, when you get to, and you know that you have to sit there for a while. Like the tears don't usually come in a 10 minute prayer. Can we all be real? They usually come when you sit there and you don't have a time limit on, when you didn't say, Oh, I've got 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. What can I crank out in this prayer? Yeah. They come when you just sit in the presence of God and you just, you're like, God, I need you. And what's awesome is that uh, I think the next thing he did was so powerful, right? He confesses. He's like, God, this is all of our sin. We got to get real. How many of us have taken the challenge to write a sin list and send it in? Let's get on that, okay? Let's confess our sin. Because when you confess your sin, you just get sobered. And suddenly the road, like it just, the scales fall off your eyes and you can see, that there, there's a scripture for that, guys. It says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. When you clean it out and your heart is pure, you could see God again. If you're trying to have vision without confessing your sin, it's not gonna happen. All you're gonna see is yourself. All you're, all you're going to see are the circumstances and the situations and the hardships. You're going to see God, the great, awesome God that can do anything. Then we see, we see here how uh, he, he fasts. Fast. He fasts. We've been challenged to fast for fruitfulness. I'm sure we're going to hear much more about that over the weekend. But he fasted because he's like, whoa, this, this, this is not going to come out by prayer, just by prayer alone. He's like, I got to pray and I got to fast. This is serious. How serious are you? Guys, oftentimes the reason I don't want to fast is because it just isn't that serious. Like it doesn't mean enough. And you know what I ask mm, myself, okay. honestly, you know what I ask myself? I'm like, if, if my mom was studying the Bible or to get restored, what, is there anything I'd be unwilling to fast from? If my mom's life was on the line and she, cause she just got diagnosed with COVID, amen, pray for her. But if her, if she ended up in a hospital and her life was on the line, would there be anything I'd be unwilling to fast from? Be like, come on, sis. Um, I'm not giving up come coffee, on, I want something easier. These are thoughts I have guys. I don't know if you do, but I do. I'll be like, do I want to give up this. coffee? I mean, that's coffee like though. Do I, do I want to give up, like, how would I just give up? How would I just give up shows, but not movies? How about I just, um, I'll give up desserts, but does that include like pastry items? Cause that's technically breakfast. And like, these are the kind of thoughts I have, but when I pull okay. it back and I think to myself, that's what does this good. really mean to me? Because then I'm not, I'm not going to withhold in my fast because every soul is precious. Everybody is someone's mother, sister, brother, auntie, wife, husband, chill child. So Everyone matters. This world matters and we need to be willing to do whatever it takes to win it for Christ. And then what's awesome is, is, is Nehemiah remembered God's promises and he recites them to God. He's like, God, I remember when you said that if we're unfaithful, you'll scatter us. But I also remember when you said that if we're faithful, no matter how far you scattered us, you'll bring us back. And we need to have promises of God written on our heart. We need to be reciting those in our prayers. Why? Because it builds, it, yes, I'm sure God loves to hear them, but it builds your faith because you get your, your thoughts out of your mind and you put God's promises there. You're like, God's going to do it. Cause he says, and God keeps his word. God's not like me. He's not fickle. He always keeps his word. He's always faithful. He cannot lie. And then he surrenders. Nehemiah just surrenders to God's providence. And we need to surrender to where God has us, whatever position, whatever role, for some of you, that means surrendering your selfish ambition. For others of you, God's called you to a role and you are fighting it. To Come on. Now. You're like, don't make me have more responsibility and lead more. I don't want to do it. No, you need to surrender on, where God Jay. has you. And you need to go spend that time in prayer so you can get the faith Come needed on, to answer the call. You know, for me, uh, sharing with Sarah the other day on the phone, I feel like the, the, the thing that keeps coming up 
all the time, all the time, all the time. And I think it was from a lesson she preached a while back. I, I don't even know if I was in SF yet, to be honest with you. It might've been like way back, but it keeps coming up. Is that concept of moving from Sarai to Sarah, right? From being princess in the kingdom to mother of nations. And every time I, I get that vision in my mind, I like, I just get scared. And I'm like, oh, because it's it, it like, I'm like, how much is gonna have to change in Shannon Renee Sears for me to go from princess to mother of nations? You know what I mean? Like, I'm so blown away by the moms on this call. I am so inspired by you. I think about the, and I think about the new moms right now in a pandemic. I think about you guys a lot and how much you go through and how hard it must be. You inspire me. Like I meditate on you in my quiet times, you know what I mean? To imitate your character. I, I'm so inspired by my sister who's on the call. She's got five kids guys and she is like a rock star mom. And I think I look at her and I'm like, Lord increase my faith. And, 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 I, and I see this vision of like, Shay, I, I didn't, I didn't create you and call you out of darkness into the light just to be some, you know, Joe Schmo, nah, 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 mediocre disciple. I called you to be a mother to nation. Stop being a princess and embrace your role. And, uh, and so guys pray for me because I, I have no idea what that's going to entail. When God gives you a vision, it, it doesn't mean there's not challenges. Like, like think about the people, Joseph got a vision and then he went into slavery. David got a vision, then he's running for his life. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people got the great visions and then it, there was a lot of hardship that followed, but it molded their character to become like, if Joseph didn't answer the vision and keep hold of the vision, despite everything he went through, how many people would have died of starvation? Cause there was a famine and wow. Joseph was the one that stood up and, ha and, and gave the plan. Right. Come on. Like if David didn't hold on to the vision that God had appointed him King long before he actually entered into the role, what would have happened? Would we have ever seen a united Israel? If Mary, who answered the call to be the mother of the, of the son of God, like what would have happened if she didn't answer that call? Ooh, I'm the Lord's servant. Do with me whatever you see. I'm like, oh, increase my faith, God. Is that your heart? Are you like, I am the Lord's hey. servant. Whatever God wants with my life, I'm all in. It's not even my life. I gave my life over. Jesus Christ is my life. My life is hidden in Christ. It's not even mine anymore. Is that your heart? And guys, honestly, this challenges me. Like I, I think about, like, I, I literally had thoughts like this. Um, God, God, what, what I, what I still, would I still be excited about being a disciple if I, if I got an accident and was a paraplegic? Is that, would that, if that was your vision for my life to preach from that state, would I, would I be, would I still be faithful and excited and fired up just to be a disciple in the wow. kingdom of God? If, 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 if I, if I had a chronic illness or chronic pain, usually it's physically related because that's where I struggle a lot is when God inflicts my body. Um, but whatever it is, if someone died, you know, and, 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 uh, it, if, if Tyler died, like what would I, would I be faithful? Like, these are things I ask myself and I go and I go in my prayer closet, my, my closet that moonlights is a D time room, a, a prayer room, all those things. I go in there and I just ball my eyes out until I get surrendered because I have no idea what's coming down the pipeline. We don't just count the cost once guys. We, we, we count the cost continually as disciples and we resurrender our hearts to Jesus is Lord. That's it. Jesus is Lord. And I'm in the kingdom. And that is far more than I ever deserve. And it is a privilege to serve the King of Kings. And so just coming in for a landing, uh, having vision is key. We've got to be obedient to the vision. Um, if we're going to win this world for Christ, there's a quote that I really love by Jonathan Swift. It says, vision is the art of seeing what is invisible to others. So we've got a vision is the art of seeing what is invisible to others. We got to open our eyes we need to catch the vision and we already need to see mountains being plunged into the sea, nations being baptized, because if we don't see it, it won't happen. Hindsight okay. is 2020. Let's catch the vision. Love you guys. Wow. That was amazing. That was amazing. That was great. Wow.